Well, good morning and welcome to Trinity on the third Sunday of Lent. So glad you're joining us. Would you turn with me to page 355? Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercies endure forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord be with you. Kneeling, let us pray. Almighty God, you know that we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. Keep us both outwardly in our bodies and inwardly in our souls, that we may defend from all adversity which may happen to the body, and from all evil thoughts which may assault the hurt and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of the Lord. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our maker. 
for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Harden not your hearts as your forebears did in the wilderness at Meribah and on that day at Massah when they tempted me. They put me to the test, though they had seen my works. Forty years long, I detested that generation and said, this people are wayward in their hearts. They do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And on, not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Citrica near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tired 
out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become to them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that with places where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on the mountain nor in Jerusalem. You will worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he came, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way. Meanwhile, the disciples were arguing, urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe and for harvest. And the reaper is already receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed him because the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, stay with them. And he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, be pleasing to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome as we celebrate 
who Jesus was and what he came to do for us on this third Sunday of Lent. These passages that we read talk a lot about water. We hear about the waters in the desert the people desperately wanted, and Moses at wit's end goes to God the Father and asks for water, and he gives it. We hear about waters in the psalm. In our lesson today, we hear of this wonderful story where Jesus asks for water from the most unlikely candidate. You see, much of our life we spend trying to keep the outsiders out and the insiders in. We've all experienced it. Perhaps last time you flew on an airplane when they took the curtain and shut it between first class and economy, you felt it. The tough guy at the door who keeps everyone out, the bouncer, if you will. Not quite our class, my dear. We're not going to hang out with these people you may have heard. The rich and the powerful marry the rich and the powerful. And our gospel passage this morning is about an outsider. Jesus and his disciples were traveling north to Judea, the area of Jerusalem, back up to Galilee. And Jesus is home. It's where he grew up. He knows this area quite well. And most Pharisees refused to go into that area. They would, in fact, spend an entire extra day to go around it, so not to have to go through Samaria. Jews hated the Samaritans. They were half-breeds. They weren't fully Jewish. They weren't fully um, Protestant. They were just half, half this and half that, and they were the lower class, and true religious Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them. In fact, if they were to go through their region, they had to spend the better part of a day or so to become clean again. But Jesus doesn't take the bypass. He doesn't take the safe route through the suburbs. He trucks right through the seedy, unclean part of town, and a wonderful thing takes place. You see, Jesus and his disciples reached a city in Samaria called Sychar. Sychar. You pronounce it how you want to. And they're hot, and they're tired, and they're thirsty. And it's in the desert in the middle of the day. It's brutal. And the disciples go into town to get some supplies. And Jesus just waits. He sits down by a well known as Jacob's Well. You can imagine he's hot, thirsty, would love to have a little bit of that water, but has no way of getting it. Until a woman comes, and he asks her for a drink. God is thirsty, and he becomes vulnerable with this outcast woman, and he expresses his need, and it's scandalous. This woman that Jesus encountered was ultimately an outsider. She was the outsider of outsiders, to be honest. In that day and age, women had a lower class. It was ugly. It's not right. Jesus didn't think it was right. She was also a Samaritan, which I said were the half-breeds. They were traitors. The descendants of the Jews married and had children with Babylonians during the captivity born differently. They looked differently. They worshiped differently. They lived differently. They had no power. They had no control. Because she was a Samaritan, she was unclean, and Jesus was not supposed to interact with her. And because she was a woman in a particular society, she was not to associate with any male who was not her family. And so this whole scene is a little bit sketchy. It's a little bit unusual. Jesus liked the unusual. That was the basis for human division at the time, clean and unclean, holy and unholy, male and female. And Jesus totally blew up the whole system. Jesus wasn't worried about himself becoming unclean. He's not worried about clean things becoming unclean. He's into making all things clean. He's not worried about insiders losing status and becoming outsiders. He's into inviting outsiders in. In fact, he's into destroying human categories altogether. That's for you too. Not just an obscure Samaritan woman in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. It's for you. That's for the unevangelized, unclean, wounded areas of our own hearts. 
That's for the do not trespass signs you have posted on your soul. That's for the he can't possibly love me there in that area of my heart. Well, all of us have those areas. They all scare us to death because we crave intimacy and love and kindness in those places also, and yet we fear rejection. We fear that he'll kick us out if he finds out what we're really like, what it's really like in here. Oh, but friend, don't be afraid. As we talked about last week, there's no need to be afraid anymore. He's not like that. He's so clean that he makes the unclean clean. He's so in that he brings the outsiders in too. So this woman that Jesus had no business talking to, no reason to talk to other than the fact that he was the creator and he loved her, they end up having a quite an interesting exchange, don't they? Jesus sees right through her. To you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. It's becoming very evident in this conversation he's having, isn't it? This woman apparently had a thirst for men, at least six men involved with her so far, Don't know what's going on here, but probably seeking identity through love and relationship. Love and relationship junkie is what she probably was, just like many of us. She's really good at pretending, like we all are, and good at lying, like some of us are, and good at hiding, like every one of us are, and the good at telling stories to protect the tender places of her heart. She's good at posing, of creating fig leaves so that no one sees that thing. She's good at hiding those ugly, wounded, afraid parts of her heart in fronting so that no one knows who she really is. Jesus says to her, go get your husband. And her answer is interesting, I don't have a husband. Again, she's protecting, she's posing. Well, okay, I'm between husbands maybe. And Jesus sees right through the lie. He knows all hearts, right? And Jesus doesn't see through her and judge her. He sees through her and loves her. Have you ever experienced that? Has anyone ever see all of you, all of your baggage, all of your scars, and loved you right there in that place where you're so ashamed and thought, you were unlovable. If it's happened to you, you probably fell in love with that person. There's a good chance you married them. And if not married them, there's a good chance they're your very best friend. That's exactly how Jesus loves you. Right in that place where you're so ashamed and afraid and hiding and falling apart, that place where you feel is the most unlovable about yourself, Jesus has a tender compassion for you right there where you least deserve it or expect it. While she was still a sinner, the scripture says, Jesus offered her salvation. He offered her himself, even before she confessed her sin. You're right about me, Jesus. The doctor's diagnosis is true. While she was in the midst of her thirst for men, Jesus offers himself to her. Those who drink of the water that I give them will never thirst. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. Friends, this water is for you too. It wasn't just for her, it's for you. While we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were still, while we were actively sinners, he died for us. It's the passage in Romans that Jolly just read a few moments ago. It's a beautiful passage because it's true for every one of us. While we were still sinners actively misbehaving, Christ died for us. 
His kindness leads us to repentance. His kindness leads us to point of being able to tell the lawful, scary truth about ourselves. And this kindness leads us to find shelter in his wounds. What a relief. By maintaining all these fraudulent identities is exhausting. The one who knows you fully also loves you fully. The one who knows you fully also loves you fully. And because he loves you fully, the one who knows you fully died for you in order to take fully away all of your sin. Then Jesus takes another risk with this woman. Jesus doesn't keep his true identity hidden. He lets her in on a secret of his own. He gets a little bit more vulnerable with him. Up until this point, nobody really knew who he was except his disciples. He kind of kept that back. But he decides to let this woman know who he is. In the middle of her wanting to argue about religion, he comes right out and says it. I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ, the woman said. And when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Think about this. The first person to whom Jesus openly and equivocally revealed that he is the Messiah, other than his disciples, wasn't the religious authority or the political power brokers or the wealthy merchants, but an unclean Samaritan woman, a despised outsider. It's almost like he was saying, I came here for you and your people too. I came here to save and rescue you. I came here to die for you. I came here to take away your sins too. With Jesus, the playing field of humanity is leveled. No insiders are outsiders. No clean or unclean. All are broken. All are rebellious. All in desperate need for rescue. All enemies of each other and God. All need reconciliation with each other and with their Heavenly Father. And yet, all deeply and perfectly and radically loved in Christ all washed clean in his blood, all invited into his kingdom, all made uh, insiders because he adopted us as his own sons and daughters. For if while we were enemies, that's an outsider, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, We even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. At this point, the disciples come up. They interrupt Jesus and the woman, and they were scandalized that Jesus was here having an intimate conversation with this Samaritan woman. We will just pretend that we didn't see that, Jesus. Let's get on out of here. But Jesus doesn't try to argue with them. He just tells them that there is a world full of outsiders who need to be invited in. And what does that look like for you and me? Maybe we should stop seeing evangelism as sales and negotiation and start seeing it as simply inviting outsiders into something good. But the woman already knew that. But by this time, the woman had gone into town And she's told everybody what had happened to her. This woman went into town and becomes an evangelist. Why? Because in Jesus she found mercy and love and relief, not mere life principles. She found healing. She found a guy that she could depend on. She found a guy that actually knew her fully and still loved her and accepted her. And she wanted her friends and her family to meet this guy. Come and meet this guy, she says. So they do, and they invited him to stay. And he doesn't just breeze through town with a few encouraging words and get his water and supplies and make his way on. No, Jesus stayed. He stayed with the outsiders. Scripture says many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. 
He told me everything I have ever done. And so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many were belie- believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The point is this. You and I, we are that woman. We are those Samaritans. We're the unclean outsiders whom Jesus loves and for whom he gave himself and bled and died in our place to take away our sins and to bring us into his family. Friends, the days of being an outsider are over. The days of having to pretend are over. The days of needing to adjust our spiritual fig leaves so that nobody knows just how unreligious we are, are over. Because the one who made you knows you. And the one who created you loves you. And he invites you to come. Come be an insider with him. And invite all your friends to come be insiders. The greatest thing we can do now is go and tell our neighbors the best news we know, that you know a guy who knows them by name and loves them and invites them to become an insider in the kingdom of God. I pray and I hope that this Easter you will invite every outsider you know to fill the pews of this church. I would rather the members of this church sit out in the courtyard and we fill this place with outsiders who have never heard the good news and we present to them the greatest news the world has ever known, that Jesus the Christ is really who he said he was and he's come to give them a brand new start. Right now, on Resurrection Sunday, begin praying now for God to give you an outsider to invite on the inside. Amen. Now that we know where living water truly comes from, it comes from Jesus, the one who can take care of all of your needs. Let us stand and together profess what we know to be true through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, With the Father and the Son, he has worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the People God sent the Son into the world to save the world. As we prepare for the Paschal Feast, let us earnestly beseech God to grant all peoples everywhere new birth in the Spirit. For the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church throughout the world, a sign on earth of the kingdom of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. For Mark, our bishop, for all priests and deacons, for all who minister in Christ, and for all the holy people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. 
for all who share the faith of Abraham and for all nations and families of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all who are tempted, oppressed, afflicted, or in need, Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For those who rest in Christ and for all the departed, Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For our families, friends, and companions, and for all those we love, especially Anne Coiner, and those named on our parish prayer list, Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Blessed are you, God of Abraham, for you made of your people a great nation. Receive the prayers we offer this day for all those in need in every place, and bless us as we come to your altar. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful, merciful God, God, we confess, confess that we have sinned against, against you in thought, thought word, and indeed. deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's greet each other in peace. Good morning. I'm so glad you're joining us on the virtual service. I hope that, that sermon inspired you and reminded you that you are an insider. Not because I say so, but because the one who knows everything says so. And he invites you to this altar rail to receive afresh and anew from him, to receive from his table, to take of his body which was broken for you, and to take from his cup that washes you clean and become a true outsider that is now an insider with a big smile on your face, knowing that you are loved and forgiven and redeemed. I hope you'll come and remember that, and that the news will be so good, so true, that you can't help yourself but to do exactly what the woman did. Go into town and tell your neighbors that you've met a guy who knows you well, and you introduce them to him. I hope you'll do that. We have several things happening in the life of this church that I'll invite you to be a part of as we prepare for Easter morning. We have a quiet day on Saturday the 18th. I invite you to come if you just need a place to be, to relax and to pray and to spend time with your Heavenly Father. We're going to start at 9 and we'll end with lunch and Eucharist. I hope you'll make that part of your Lenten journey. We also have a 5 o'clock service that meets in here every week. Perhaps Sunday mornings are difficult for you to make. Five o'clock is for you. I call it guilt-free Sunday. You can go fox hunting, play a little golf, do some tennis, get some yard work done, and then come in the week or begin the week, depending on how you see it, at five o'clock for a 45-minute service right here at Trinity. We call it the sanctuary service. It's peaceful. It's candlelit. It's a lovely way to end or, or begin your week. Well, with that, I invite you to give to this parish. You can simply follow the prompts here in the bottom of the screen. I'll remind you of the words of Jesus who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I invite you, give generously, not because you have to, but because you get to. And then come, meet me at this table where Jesus is your host. <laughs>
thanks come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord our God. It is very meet, right, in our bound duty, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was in every way tempted as we are, yet did not sin, by whose grace we are able to triumph over every evil, and to live no longer unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, For that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord, our Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we, thy humble servants, do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer unto thee, the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, we render unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these gifts of creature, of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merit and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be reasonable, holy, and living sacrifices unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that we, and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion 
may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction, and made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sin to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bound duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, and with whom, and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God, for you the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith. With thanksgiving. Would you please join me in our post-communion prayer, found on page 339. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee, for thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good work as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee in the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, 
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.